This is a Rolex Datejust from 1985, and boy does this watch need some help. It's a non-runner sent in by a viewer. It appears the crown was yanked right off the threads of the stem, which is now looking pretty mangled. The bracelet, case, and crystal look quite worn, but this isn't unreasonable for a watch of this age. What does concern me, however, is the fogged appearance under the crystal, meaning there is likely some moisture that's made its way inside the case. There's also some discoloring. Honestly, I don't know what to expect with this one. Will it ever live up to its chronometer rating, assuming I can even get it running again? Here's the rest of the crown, but the thing is, this is a screw-down crown. There's a section of the crown that's still attached to the stem that was supposed to have a spring inside, but that seems to be missing now. According to Dan, his wife gifted him the watch upon the birth of their first child. He wore it proudly for years and had it cleaned a couple of times. But time has passed and the watch finally stopped working, and so he put it aside for the future. And that was 20 years ago. At some point, Dan took it to a jeweler for repairs, but it didn't run for very long after that. Time to crack open this case to see what I'm dealing with. Inside is the 3035 automatic movement. Right away, I'm noticing some of the screws are a bit corroded, but overall it doesn't look too bad. Hang on a second. What is all this? Is that oil? It does appear to be. That's oil all right, and a lot of it. The balance won't budge, but it's actually possible the hack is activated. I'll see if I can get it out of hacking mode and convince the stem out of the movement. The screw down crown features a mechanism that can securely lock the crown when it's not being operated in order to prevent any operational errors and to improve the watch's water resistance. There should be a spring inside this part to help push the crown away from the movement after it's been unscrewed. The balance did spring to life with the hacking mode disabled. This is good, so now I can establish a baseline of performance. Ah yes, the infamous snowstorm trace. Well, let's dig in and see if there's any hope for this movement. There are two case screws that are loosened, and the movement is rotated inside the case until it can be lifted out. There's a good deal of moisture and uh, oil splatter underneath that crystal. I couldn't get the crown to re-thread onto the stem, so I'm using this pin vise to hold it instead. You can see the difference between the 30 and the 31, right? I really hope that's not permanent. The quick set date isn't exactly quick anymore. It's lost its snappiness, probably due to all this oil. I'm aligning the hands so they can be removed with the Presto tool. There are two dial foot screws along the rim of the movement. With the dial safely out of the way, I flip the movement back over and begin by removing the automatic bridge, which has the rotor attached. So here's what I think happened. Dan took his watch to the jeweler, who may or may not have snapped off the crown, then proceeded to squeeze oil into the case tube in the hopes that something positive would happen. There's no other explanation as to why this much oil is dripping from this movement. With the automatic bridge removed, I now have access to the click, which I can gently hold back to let down the power of the main spring.
The balance is now removed and stored in a safe location. On the dial side, the date wheel is released using this quarter turn lever. It can then be slid away after relieving the pressure from the jumper. The 30 is the least stained as it was the numeral that didn't have the oil trapped against it over all those years. The date jumper is now removed. This is an interesting one. It's reverse threaded, and I guess it's a nut rather than a screw. No, there's some corrosion or damage on this one too. The date indicator drive wheel is now removed. There's a sprung lever with a jewel attached, serving as a cam yoke for the date indicator drive wheel. The date corrector is uninstalled. Looks like this one suffers from corrosion as well, like some of the other screws in the movement. The hour wheel is lifted away. The cannon pinion is removed with the help of the Presto Puller. The date ring seat is removed from the movement plate. The date drive wheel cam is now removed. The spring for this cam rivals most springs I've seen even in the largest of pocket watches. It sure is a beast. One wrong move and this one will rocket into another galaxy. The pallet bridge is now removed with the pallet fork stuck to its hole jewel. The train bridge is removed, also with the third wheel stuck within its hole jewel. The center seconds wheel and offset second wheel are lifted away. Now I gently remove the escape wheel, peeking out from under the minute bridge. Look at the oil just oozing out from under that ratchet wheel. The crown wheel screw is reverse threaded. The assembly here consists of a friction spring underneath the core, which is in the center of the crown wheel. The click and its spring are also removed for cleaning. The winding bridge is removed, exposing the intermediate crown wheel and what's known as the wigwag pinion. This all serves as part of the interface from the automatic winding work. The barrel bridge is uninstalled. The mainspring barrel had its arbor a bit stuck to its bushing. Well, that's par for the course. The arbor is removed and I can unwind the spring. I don't plan on reusing it, I'm just not sure if it was affected by the moisture like some of the other parts, so I'm not going to chance it. The minute bridge is removed, allowing me to lift out the minute pinion. Back to the dial side, the setting lever jumper, which has the intermediate date corrector wheel mounted to it, is uninstalled. 
The intermediate setting gear was a stowaway thanks to the oil. The minute wheel is lifted away. I'm now removing the yoke spring and then the yoke. The setting lever spring and the setting lever are uninstalled. I can now slide out the hacking lever. Finally, the sliding clutch and winding pinion are removed. I like to separate any shock protected cap jewels from their respective hole jewels for the cleaning cycle. Doing so allows the cleaning fluid better access through the holes, meaning I'll have a greater chance at cleaning what sludge remains on the surfaces of the synthetic ruby these jewels are made of. The jewels that do have end stones on this movement, which are both the balance jewels and both the scape wheel jewels, are all shock protected using the KIF shock protection system. The balance is just temporarily reinstalled so that the jewel can be safely removed. Beginning with disassembling the automatic winding system, the rotor pinion is removed first. This reveals a small retaining clip that is simply slid out from around the rotor arbor. And now the rotor can be set aside. The automatic bridge can be removed. This reveals two reversing wheels and the output drive wheel. The reversing wheels are disassembled for cleaning as well. I knew this was a long shot, but I'm using a gentle paintbrush dipped in naphtha to thin and remove the oil residue from the date ring. In my past experience, I knew this wouldn't make matters any worse, but at least has some upside. In the end, I was pleasantly surprised with the outcome. Normally, and I have to stress this, trying to clean a dial usually ends in disaster, but I can't just leave the oil sitting on it like this. I'll do my best to try to clean it off using the same process I used on the date ring. I would later take a sharpened piece of pegwood to edge around the logo and the indices. All jewels and pivots are inspected for damage, and I'll take a closer look after cleaning is complete prior to reassembly. The objective of the pre-cleaning process is to eliminate the majority of the grime and excess oils to minimize the contamination of the cleaning fluid and to initially break up most of the foul areas such as the inside of the jewel holes.
automatic braking grease is applied to the walls of the mainspring barrel. As mentioned earlier, I purchased a brand new mainspring for this movement. The convention is typically the painted side of the retaining ring points up as the spring is pressed into the barrel. Mobius D5 lubricates the hole in the barrel where the arbor will turn. The barrel lid can be snapped into place. Before reassembly, I'm now taking the time to reinspect every jewel. I just want to make sure the cleaning ritual did a thorough job and there isn't anything that's going to foul the pivots. I'm reinstalling each of the end stones underneath their respective kiff springs. Some people place a droplet of 9010 on the stone before installation, but I'll use an automatic oiler to do this after the fact. I will now remove the carcass of the old screw down crown as I have ordered a replacement. The stem itself is not damaged. I believe it to be good practice to use a little thread locker to secure the crown to the threads of the stem. Mollycoat DX grease is used to provide some lubrication to the metal-on-metal -metal sliding surfaces of the keyless work. This includes the surfaces of the stem, as well as the winding surfaces of the sliding clutch. The winding pinion and sliding clutch are placed, while being supported with a bit of rotico until the stem can be inserted. Mobius D5 lubricates the sliding bed of the hacking lever before it's reinstalled. D5 also oils the hole where the setting lever post protrudes. The setting lever is reinstalled such that it secures the stem and also activates the hacking lever upon pulling the crown. The setting lever spring is now installed. A touch of D5 lubricates the post where the yoke is installed. The yoke spring is reinstalled. D5 lubricates the minute wheel and intermediate setting gear posts.
and now the setting lever jumper can be fitted over the keyless work. I decided to lightly grease the intermediate date corrector wheel with some D5. The minute pinion is lowered into place. The bridge over the pinion can now be reinstalled. The mainspring barrel is placed onto the movement, using D5 to lubricate the upper and lower arbor bushings. And now the barrel bridge can be fitted. The wigwag pinion and intermediate crown wheel are reinstalled under the winding bridge. They are lubricated with a little bit of D5. The click spring is reinstalled, followed by the click. The crown wheel is reinstalled along with its core. I did forget about the friction spring, but I'll come to that realization later. The ratchet wheel is reinstalled. The second wheel is lowered into place. The center seconds wheel receives a touch of Mobius 9010, before it is inserted through the hollow minute pinion arbor. The escape wheel is shimmied into position, followed by the installation of the third wheel. The train wheel bridge can now be reinstalled, taking care to ensure that all pivots are seated in their respective jewel holes before the bridge is finally tightened down. The pallet jewels each receive a small droplet of Mobius 941. The pallet fork can now be installed. I gently ensure the fork pivots are seated in the jewel holes before tightening down the bridge. All train wheel jewels are oiled with Mobius 9010. It's almost time for the moment of truth. I'm excited and anxious to find out how well this movement performs. The balance is now reinstalled.
I'll now oil the end stone I removed earlier with Mobius 9010. It is mated with the whole jewel and then reinstalled into the balance cock. Each of the reversers are lubricated and reassembled. The output drive wheel is placed in the automatic plate before the reversing wheels are fitted above it. Now the automatic bridge can be reinstalled. The pivots are each lubricated prior to installing the rotor. The retaining clip is reinstalled, which secures the rotor to the automatic work. The rotor pinion is now lowered into place. A touch of D5 is used to oil the post where the date drive wheel cam yoke will sit. The cam yoke for the date drive wheel has a massive spring that you saw me remove earlier. I recommend wearing eye protection for this part. and the Cameo can be lowered into place while holding back its spring. A touch of D5 is placed on the center wheel arbor before the cannon pinion is reinstalled. The arrow wheel is lowered on top the cannon pinion. D5 lubricates the date drive wheel post and the little post where the cam jewel sits. Now the date drive wheel can be lowered into place, ensuring the yoke and its jewel rests against the cam underneath the wheel. The reverse threaded nut secures it into position. The date ring seat is fitted back onto the movement plate. I'm now reinstalling the date corrector. The date jumper is now fitted back into place. The date ring can finally be lowered down and slid under the various retainers, while ensuring the date jumper fits within one of the indices. And then the quarter turn clip can be used to finalize the installation of the date indicator ring. The date corrector has a ring with an eccentric hole that rotates with the crown when it is pulled out to the first position. The teeth of the corrector push the date indicator ring one increment at a time. With the crown pulled to the second or time setting position, it should increment the date once every 24 hours. Recall I did forget that friction spring when I originally reinstalled the crown wheel. I'm now correcting that oversight. The dial is reinstalled and I will then tighten the two foot screws along the rim of the movement plate to secure it.
The loom on the hands need to be replaced as the existing material is now oil stained. I'm using a piece of sharpened peg wood to gently scrape off the old loom from the back side of the hands. With the loom removed and the hands completely cleaned, I use an old oiler to gently apply the newly mixed loom from a kit I purchased online. Capillary action helps wick the loom into place. It does shrink a tiny bit as it dries, so I need to be somewhat generous while at the same time not going overboard as I don't want to actually increase the effective thickness of the hands or I'll run into clearance issues. Both the case back and case tube gaskets will be replaced. I will be polishing this case as agreed to by the owner with the understanding that there are some deeper scratches that will still be present. I'll use my judgment for how far I go with it as I don't want to affect the shape or the angles in any way. As for the original crystal, well, it too could benefit from a little cleanup. My bezel remover tool isn't great and just didn't have the clearance needed for this case. As an alternative, I can safely remove a bezel like this using a small blade, incrementally working my way around it. Heat tape is used to mask off parts of the surface to control what gets polished. Likewise, it's also used to protect the polished areas when freshening up the surfaces that need a brushed appearance. I'm using a Scotch-Brite scouring pad to slowly refresh the brushed surfaces of the case and bracelet. Meanwhile, onto the crystal, it can be restored with a little bit of polywatch and a lot of elbow grease. Two hours later, the crown is temporarily inserted into the case, which takes the guesswork out of aligning the cyclops when reinstalling the crystal. And now the bezel is laid over the case before being pressed on with the tool. A little before and after comparison. Like I said, I try to strike a balance when it comes to refinishing cases like this. Now to trigger the date changeover so that I can get the hands installed at midnight. Verifying the date change with the hands installed, my goal was to get the changeover to happen better than within a few minutes of midnight. Satisfied with the results, I can finally reinstall the sweep seconds hand.
The Rolex Datejust, introduced in 1945 for the company's 40th anniversary, was a groundbreaking creation, being the first automatically winding wristwatch to feature a date display that changed over at midnight. This introduction marked a pivotal moment in watchmaking history, setting a new standard for functionality and design. Over the years, the Datejust has undergone several evolutions and refinements, such as the addition of the Cyclops magnifying glass in the 50s and the quickset date feature in the 70s. The Rolex Datejust 16014, produced in the late 70s and 80s, takes center stage in this video. The reference is lauded for its classical design and technological advancements. The inclusion of the quickset date function, powered by the Rolex Caliber 3035 movement, contributed to its reliability and ease of use. In the late 80s, Rolex then introduced a newer vision of the Datejust with the 3135 movement, resulting in incremental improvements in accuracy and reliability. But more notably, the watches began being produced using a sapphire crystal, which replaced the acrylic crystal used in past references. The Datejust line continues to be updated in modern times, with the most recent revision occurring in 2009, with the introduction of the 41mm version alongside the 36mm model. Available with either the Oyster or Jubilee bracelet, the Datejust was not designed for a specific purpose or activity like some of Rolex's other models. Instead, it's simply a classic and reliable watch, versatile in its aesthetic qualities that can be worn every day. In terms of timekeeping reliability, the movement in this watch originally met chronometer standards and had passed COSC certifications. Among other considerations, that means this movement should keep time to within minus 4 to plus 6 seconds per day across the 5 major positions. So, while I feel that this movement is keeping good time, all things considered, I think I can dial it in a bit more and perhaps bring it back to chronometer accuracy. Rolex uses what's called a Microstella system of regulation on its free-sprung Breguet overcoil balances. The only way to regulate such a balance is by turning in and out these little pairs of star-shaped screws. The larger set impact timekeeping by 2 seconds per day per increment, while the smaller set has a 1 second per day per increment impact. This special Microstella adjustment wrench has a dial built into it to make it easier to see the increments as the screw is turned. Adjustments can be made in hacking mode even while the movement is cased. It's a bit disconcerting to observe, I know, but rest assured, the balance was designed for this type of adjustment and no pivots were harmed in the making of this video. And here, the end result. Performance is within the desired range across the positions. That being said, my little workshop is no substitute for a true COSC test lab, but for a nearly 40-year-old watch, it's still keeping remarkable time despite the state I had received it in. So, I hope you learned something from this video today, but if not, I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.